Okay, we will <coughs> we continue now with the discussion of the Arya Pariyasana Sutta. And this sutta, in this sutta, the Buddha is describing his own renunciation and his quest for enlightenment. And as we saw last time, when the Buddha actually begins the actual narrative portion of the sutta, he describes how he was earlier leading the home life and being himself subject to birth, old age, sickness, death, sorrow, and defilement. Like ordinary unenlightened people, he was also attached to things which were subject to birth, old age, sickness, death, sorrow, and defilement. But then there arose within him this burning desire to realize that which lies outside and beyond the limitations of the contingent world. In other words, to realize that which is unborn, ageless, without illness, deathless, sorrowless, and undefiled, what he calls Nibbana or Nirvana, the supreme security from bondage. And then he set out on this, no, what he calls the noble quest, renouncing the household life, cutting off his hair and beard, even while his parents were weeping and tried to convince him to stay. And he went into homelessness. And he first came to one of the most prominent spiritual teachers of this period, whose name was Alara Kalama. And under Alara Kalama, he learned first Alara's doctrine, which is never given in the text. And then from Alara, he learned the meditative practice that brought the realization of this doctrine, which I explained last time was the meditation called in Pali, Akinchinyayatana, which means the base of nothingness. And what's rather interesting is that in no other yogic or meditative text from the Indian tradition is there a state mentioned under the name the base of nothingness. But this meditative attainment is recognized quite frequently within the Buddha system. So it seems to me, this is personal conjecture, that probably Alara didn't actually use the same name and the same description when he was teaching. But he would have taught of a certain meditative state and would have taught the method to realize it. And the Buddha would have practiced that met method and attained that state. And then later, when he systematized the different stages of meditation, he used terms which he had coined himself, and he would have found that within his system of meditation, the stage called the base of nothingness was the counterpart of what he had practiced under Alara Kalama. And within the Buddhist, the Buddha's systematization or schematization of the stages of meditation the base of nothingness is one of the four arupa attainments or formless attainments. We use the Pali expression arupa samapati, the formless or immaterial meditative attainments. <coughs> yeah, the first of the four formless attainments is called the base of infinite space. Then, when one masters that, one goes on to the base of infinite consciousness. Then, when one masters that, one goes to the base of nothingness. And it's called nothingness. This has nothing to do, 
no pun intended. <laughs> it has nothing to do with sunyata or emptiness of later Buddhism, but rather it has no, this is not a realization through wisdom or insight, but rather this is an attainment purely within the sphere of samadhi or concentration. But through the mastery of concentration, first one masters the dhyanas or meditative absorptions, then one passes beyond that to a state in which one can realize or perceive in meditation the infinity of space. Then after mastering that, one shifts the attention to the consciousness which is aware of space. And so one realizes the next stage called the base of infinite consciousness. Then one attends to the, what I call the insubstantiality or lack of solidity in this infinite consciousness. And one gets some sense of the absence of anything solid or substantial in it any kind of obstruction in it, in this expansive consciousness. And then that is the base of nothingness. It's not a realization through insight, through panya or prajna, through wisdom, but it's purely through the deepening of concentration. And so the bodhisattva, the future Buddha now, has mastered this attainment under Alara Kalama and he comes to Alara, reports his attainment and Alara is very joyful and happy to have a disciple who has so quickly mastered this attainment which might have taken him, we don't know, maybe 10, 15, 20 years of meditation in solitude to achieve And so Alara confirms that the Bodhisattva is now on the same same level with himself and Alara invites the Bodhisattva to become his co-teacher to lead their, his community of disciples. But the Bodhisattva through his own inherent wisdom, through his own uncompromising search for truth, does not want a position as a leader of a spiritual community, but he wants to realize the complete liberation from dukkha, from suffering. And so he reflects, here I'm at Sutta number 26, the top of page 258. He reflects that this Dhamma, and here the word Dhamma is being used in the sense of doctrine, not the Buddha's own doctrine, but the doctrine and practice of Alara Kalama, does not lead to disenchantment, Nibida, complete turning away from worldliness, to dispassion, Viraga, the ending of passion or lust, to cessation, to peace, to direct knowledge, to enlightenment, to Nibbana, And then this is the important phrase, but, oh, and it's a little obscure in this translation, but only to reappearance in the base of nothingness. But here the Pali word upapati, translated reappearance, really means rebirth in the base of nothingness. And as I explained last time, each of these meditative states Well, any state of consciousness, any state of karmic consciousness has a potential to generate rebirth into a realm that corresponds to its own nature. Or to use the term that I used last week, its own vibrational frequency. And so through ordinary sense-based consciousness, the ordinary sense-based consciousness will tend to bring rebirth into one of the sensuous planes of existence.
like the human plane. If we do bad deeds, it could, that consciousness can bring us to the lower planes. The jhanas or meditative absorptions will bring rebirth into realms of existence which are called the rupa datu, the realm of subtle matter or of refined form. And the formless attainments, the arupa samapattis, if they are mastered, that attainment will bring rebirth into four planes of existence, very, very subtle planes of existence, which are their objective counterparts. And so somebody who masters the third attainment, the base of nothingness, and doesn't go any further by way of insight or wisdom, when he passes away, that consciousness will tend to produce rebirth in the objective realm called, also called the base of nothingness. That's the objective counterpart of that subjective meditative state. And it's said, according to the Buddha's text, that lifespan in the base of nothingness is 60,000 kalpas, or aeons. You know, maybe some of you know, <laughs> the theory about the Big Bang. And according to the Big Bang, I think, theory, the universe was supposed to have started 17 billion years ago, <laughs> and it's still going. <laughs> And then according to the big, I think it's called the big crunch theory, after the universe reaches its maximum point of expansion, if there's enough there's a dark matter in the universe, the particles will start attracting each other, then they'll start collapsing upon each other until there's a complete contraction of the material universe. Well, that entire process of expansion and contraction is one kalpa, <laughs> and the lifespan and the base of nothingness is 60,000 of those. So, quite a long time. <laughs> and if it seems inconceivable to us, we think about some of these creatures, little insects that come up from the ground. They live maybe 10, 20 minutes, then pass away. <laughs> and if you tell them that a human being, that you, there are human beings who live for 80 years, 90 years, They'll say, come on, man, stop pulling my leg. No, not possible. <laughs> Eighty years, you know what that means? <laughs> I mean, we've got long-lived insects going on for 30, some of them have gone up to 30 minutes. <laughs> Okay, so now we come, we continue with the sutta. Okay, so now when the bodhisattva, he became disillusioned with the teaching of his first master, Alara Kalama, and so he was disappointed and left it. And so still now, we're in paragraph 16, in search of what is wholesome, seeking for the good, Seeking the supreme state of sublime peace, I went to another spiritual teacher whose name is Udaka Ramaputta and said to him, Friend, I want to lead the holy life in this Dhamma and discipline. And then Udaka Ramaputta explained in the same way that Alara did. He gave him a synopsis of the teaching said that one who practices diligently can realize it for himself through direct knowledge. And so the Bodhisattva quickly mastered this doctrine intellectually. Now, this is an important point, which if you just read very quickly, you might not recognize. Also, <laughs> if you don't know Pali or Sanskrit, also the point will, can escape but the name Ramaputta 
means son of Rama. So Uddhaka is actually the son of somebody named Rama, who was, it seems, the founder of this particular spiritual community, or perhaps the original formulator of this teaching, of this system. And this passage here, it's not completely parallel to the previous passage on Alara Kalama, because reading this text, it seems that Uttaka, Rama's son, did not himself realize the higher state, but he speaks, the text speaks about Rama as having realized it. So it seems Uttaka became the leader of the community after his father Rama passed away, and Uttaka is still, or Uttaka, is still striving to realize it. He knows the doctrine, he knows the practice, but hasn't yet attained attained it. So the but the Bodhisattva comes to Udaka and inquires about the practice by which Rama, the original teacher, attained realization. And then Udaka explained to the Bodhisattva the base of neither perception nor non-perception. And now within the Buddhist schematization of the meditative states, this is the fourth and highest formless attainment called in Pali Nevasanyana Sanyayatana. It's a state which is said to be so extremely subtle that one cannot say that there's definitely awareness or perception in that state. And yet it's not a state of blankness or unconsciousness, so you can't say there's no perception in it. But the perception or awareness has become so refined, so subtle, that one can't characterize it as being either present or absent. And so now the Bodhisattva learns this practice, he undertakes it, and then he says that I soon quickly entered upon and abided in that state by realizing it for myself with direct knowledge. And then the Bodhisattva goes to Uddhakarama Putta and asks him, he says, Friend, was it in this way that Rama, that's Rama the teacher, declared that he entered upon and dwelt in this Dhamma by realizing it for himself with direct knowledge? And Uddhaka says, That is the way, friend. Then the Bodhisattva says that I myself has, have realized this and Uddhaka, Uddhaka, instead of being jealous and envious and resentful, thinking that this new arrival has already surpassed me, he's again, he's happy and joyful and says it is a gain for us, great gain, that we have such a venerable one as yourself living the holy life with us. You yourself have realized the same attainment that Rama, the great master, realized when he was alive. And now Uttaka says to him, here I'm on page 259 at the end of the first paragraph, you know the Dhamma that Rama knew and Rama knew the Dhamma that you know As Rama was, so are you. As you are, so is Rama. Come, friend, now lead this community. In other words, Uttaka, who has been the leader of the community, is now ready to step down and say, you are now the teacher. You should be the teacher. You're the one who knows. Even I myself don't know. And so the Bodhi, now the Buddha is speaking. He says, thus, Uddhakaramaputta, my companion in the holy life, 
placed me in the position of a teacher and accorded me the highest honor. But it occurred to me, again, this Dhamma does not lead to disenchantment, to dispassion, to cessation, to peace, to direct knowledge, to enlightenment, to Nibbana, but only to rebirth in the base of neither perception nor non-perception. And now, <laughs> the existence, there is a objective, objective sphere of existence called the base of n- neither perception nor non-perception, the neva san, neva sanyana sanyayatana. And those people who master that meditative attainment in this human life and still retain it at the time of death, get reborn into this base of neither perception nor non-perception. And the lifespan in that state is said to be 84,000 great kalpas, maha kalpas, 84,000 big bangs. It's not like the human being who lives for 90 years, but the insect, one insect is saying to the other, There are some human beings who live even to be 110, 120 years. (laughs) But the Bodhisattva saw that this state too was deficient. That it's something which is impermanent. One lives there 84,000 great aeons. Then eventually that alarm clock goes off. And <laughs> you realize life has come to an end and whoop, one falls away from even this great highest sphere of, of conscious existence and has to take rebirth elsewhere. And so when he recognized this, then the Bodhisattva became disappointed with that doctrine and left it to seek elsewhere. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. This is, would be just a compression of the conversation. Excuse me? Yeah. Yeah, because this is, being, don't forget that this is an oral literature which is being passed down. And so it, they can't relate the entire conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there would have been, of course, a, a fuller conversation. Whether the Buddha actually related that conversation to the monks, that I don't know. He could have even even compressed it when relating it. But certainly for the purpose of transmission, oral transmission, a lot had to be simplified and sort of edited to make it compact. Uh, Does the uh, Sanya have something to do with the translation? Yeah, I don't want to get to sort of go off on a tangent now on sort of doctrinal questions like that. We're really tracing like the story of the Buddha's quest for enlightenment. If we get into the five khandhas and how these khandhas relate to meditation, then it's we're going too far as I think we will pass that by now in order to keep on the straight track of we want to follow the account of the Buddha's quest for enlightenment not to get into sort of these technical doctrinal issues. Okay, so now the Bodhisattva has left his teachers and he's still in search of what is wholesome, the supreme state of sublime peace. Then he goes wandering through the Magadan country. This would be, Magadha would be the area with its capital at 
Rajagaha until he came to a place called Senanigama near Uruvela. And there he sees a very beautiful piece of ground with a flowing river. And there's a village nearby for alms. And then he thinks that this is a suitable place for striving. And so he sits down here thinking, this will serve for striving. Okay, now if you just read on (laughs) in this sutta, it seems right away that the Buddha sits down and gains enlightenment. But if we know the traditional accounts of the Buddha's quest for enlightenment, they speak about him as leaving the household life at the age of 29 and attaining enlightenment at the age of 35. So there's actually a six-year period between the time when the Buddha renounced and the time he attained enlightenment. And during this period, he undertook many other practices, particularly the practice of self-mortification or extreme ascetic practices. And as I mentioned in the program for this study course, at this point we are going to switch channels off the sutta. We put it on like hold. We And we go over to another sutta, which gives another perspective on the Buddha's quest for enlightenment. And then after this will be sutta number four, which I will take now. Then next week, I will take sutta number 36, the Mahasachika Sutta, which gives a fuller account of the ascetic practices. And I recommend for you to read to get a still fuller picture of the ascetic practices, these passages from Sutta Majjhima number 12, the Mahasi Hanada Sutta. Okay, so let us switch now to Sutta number 4, which I had suggested that you read. I just go very quickly through the earlier parts of the Sutta. Everybody have it? Okay, this sutta begins when a Brahmin by the name of Janusoni comes to the Buddha and he asks whether the Buddha's monastic disciples take the Buddha, Master Gotama, as their leader, helper and guide and follow his example. And the Buddha says that This is the case. This is the case. And then somehow the conversation turns to the topic of living in remote jungle places in the forest, which are hard to endure. Seclusion is hard to practice and it is hard to enjoy solitude. So now here, well, we'll continue further. And then the Buddha says that that is so. And the Buddha explains how before his enlightenment, again, when he was still not yet enlightened, a bodhisattva, he thought that forests, the remote forest places are hard to live in and that they will cause insanity if one has no concentration. But the Buddha considered all, or as a bodhisattva, he considered all of the qualities necessary to live in the forest. And he realized that he had all of those qualities within himself. And what's interesting is that in this sutta, the Buddha is describing practices which he undertook in solitude in a forest, in a remote forest. And yet in sutta number 26, which we just left, he speaks about coming to a very beautiful, agreeable stretch of land by the side of a river close by a village for alms. So apparently, between the time he left Uddhaka Ramaputta and the time he came to this place, which was later to become known as Bodh Gaya, he spent time living 
deep in the forest undertaking his spiritual practices. I'm just quickly skipping over all of the qualities needed to live in the forest. You can just read them just to get an idea. Until we come, paragraph number 20, just to give an idea of one of the types of practices that the Bodhisattva undertook. That there are certain days of the fortnight considered especially auspicious. These are the nights of the 14th and 15th and the 8th of the fortnight. That's the full moon or new moon nights and the night of the quarter moon. And I guess it was a common belief in this period that on these nights any dangerous, tormenting spirits, ghosts, goblins, uh, yakshas, demons will come out and haunt the forest and will capture anybody living there who's not sufficiently well endowed spiritually. And so the Bodhisattva made it a point to go to specially horrifying places such as the shrines and orchids, woodlands and trees in order to face fear and dread so that he would put himself into very frightening terrifying situations so that deliberately so that fear would arise in his mind and he would struggle and strive to overcome that fear. And then while he's living there, sometimes there would, a wild animal would come up to him or a peacock would knock a branch off a tree or a wind would blow through the leaves and then he would think, maybe this is the fear and dread coming. I guess by fear and dread here he means the source of fear and dread, the demon or goblin or uh, dangerous, fearful spirit. So then he thought to himself, why am I always worried about this fear and dread coming? What if I make a determination when fear and dread arise in my mind, I will remain in the same posture until that fear and dread subsides. So if he was walking and then the fear and dread came upon him, then he would not sit, he would not stand, stop, he would not stand still, he would not sit down, not lie down, but he remained walking, continued to walk until he had conquered fear and dread. Similarly, when standing, when sitting, when lying down, in whatever posture the fear and dread came to him, then he would subdue that fear and dread in the same posture. Okay, now comes a passage that I like... <laughs> It shows how, in a way, how clear the Buddha is as a thinker. He says, there are some, there are Brahmins, some ascetics and Brahmins who perceive day when it is night and night when it is day. That is, they seem to be confused thinkers who can't see things correctly. But I say that that is an abiding or dwelling in delusion on their part. But I am one who perceived night when it is night and day when it is day. Rightly speaking, if it were to be said of anyone that a being not subject to delusion has appeared in the world and so on, it is of me indeed that rightly speaking this should be said. I think this is to show that the Bodhisattva had all the necessary qualities for attaining full enlightenment. And now he goes on to describe his actual attainment of enlightenment, the process by which it took place. Here it seems now he is actually sitting in the seat of enlightenment, though he hasn't described himself as coming to that place. He says, tireless energy was aroused in me and unremitting mindfulness was established. 
My body was tranquil and untroubled, my mind concentrated and unified. And here within this short passage, we see a reference to three of the spiritual faculties, which are considered the main factors of, in gaining enlightenment or the higher wisdom. One is energy, virya, which here it's tireless. A second is mindfulness or sati. And the third is concentration, samadhi. And now, well, according to the traditional account, when the bodhisattva sat down, with the intention to realize enlightenment when he knew that his faculties were mature enough, he made a determination. He sat down in a spot under a tree, which later became known as the Bodhi tree. So interestingly, this tree, it's not mentioned in the sutta accounts of the Buddha's enlightenment, though it's mentioned in the commentaries. He sat down and crossed his legs and then made a determination, a resolution that he would not rise up from that position even if his blood were to dry up, even if his flesh were to dry up till there was nothing but skin and bone left. But he would not rise up until his mind was liberated. And then in the traditional account, something else happens which it's not mentioned in the old suttas. What is it? Those of you who know the Buddha story. Right, exactly. There comes a big battle with Mara. Mara is the evil one, the sort of symbol for all of the defilements, but also regarded in Buddhism as a very powerful deity, the deity, as I mentioned the other day, who doesn't have any function. He's not like the Christian Satan with the function of getting beings to come to hell. Mara is content just to keep beings within samsara. And so he tries to discourage those who are striving for liberation by enticing them with the pleasures of the senses, the pleasures, even of the heavenly worlds. He instructs people to do good and meritorious deeds. He doesn't try to get them to become murderers and thieves, but to do good, virtuous, worldly deeds so that you gain merit, which will bring you to a happy heavenly rebirth where you can enjoy yourself (laughs) until you get reborn and come back to some other realm of existence. And so in the traditional account, there takes place this great battle in the early evening between Mara, who comes with his armies. First, Mara tries to tempt the Buddha by displaying many sensually enticing images, beautiful dancing girls, and so on. His daughters come and try to seduce the Bodhisattva but the Buddha remains imperturbable. Then Mara tries to frighten the Buddha by conjuring up images of storms and frightful demons. But again, the Buddha remains unshaken, or the Bodhisattva remains unshaken. Then Mara challenges the Bodhisattva's right even to be sitting on that spot, striving for enlightenment, and says, what right do you have to be sitting here? Then the Bodhisattva says, I have fulfilled the practice of the paramis or paramitas, the virtues, sublime virtues needed to achieve Buddhahood. Then Mara says, 
Do you have any witness for this? At first, Ma returns to his own retinue and says, He has no right to be there. Don't you testify to this? And they all say, Yes, yes, you're right. He has to leave. But the Bodhisattva, then, then Mara says, Do you have any witness for your fulfillment of the Paramis? Then the Bodhisattva says, The earth is my witness. And then he takes his right hand and places it on the ground to call the earth to witness. And then the earth shakes, thunders, and quakes. And the voice comes. In some versions, a goddess comes from the earth and says, I am his witness. And at that point, then, the armies of Mara are scattered. (laughs) But in the old accounts in the suttas, there's actually a poem in the Sutta Nipata, one of the works, smaller works of the Pali Canon, in which when the Bodhisattva is undertaking the ascetic practices, it seems, Mara comes to him and tries to convince him to give up the ascetic practices and live a good, virtuous household life performing works of merit. And then when the Bodhisattva refuses, then Mara comes to him. Or actually in the verse, it's the Bodhisattva who is speaking to Mara and speaking about the ten armies of Mara, which include sensual desire, laziness, gluttony, despondency. I don't remember all of them. And it seems that this metaphorical use of the expression the armies of Mara to signify the different defilements that detract one from the path to enlightenment. This became the basis for the development of the account, the commentarial or later account of Mara as being the head of a vast army of demons who try to push the Bodhisattva away from the sight of enlightenment. So anyway, now we return keep to the Sutta account, leaving behind the developed version of the Buddha, what they call the Buddha legend. And here, as evening sets in, or night sets in, the Buddha, his mind settles down And he starts to enter into states of deeper meditation, which are called the jhanas. We will see when we come to the next sutta, Majjhima number 36, the Mahasachika Sutta, that the Buddha actually, in a sense, discovered the jhanas as being the way to enlightenment, the middle way which he had been missing out on by following the path of extreme asceticism. And the jhanas, which I'm going to treat only briefly here, because we will come back to them later, where I can treat them in more detail. These are four stages in the deepening of samadhi, or concentration. They're highly exalted stages of mind, in which the mind leaves behind all the sensory imagery and discursive thought processes in which it's ordinarily entangled and becomes focused one-pointedly upon a single object. One attains the jhana, the jhanas, by choosing a single, simple object We call it kamatana, meditation subject, which acts as a suitable basis for the unification of the mind. And to attain the jhanas, first one has to overcome the five big obstacles, which are called the five hindrances. Sensual desire, ill will, then dullness and drowsiness, then 
restlessness and remorse and then doubt. And once the five hindrances are dispelled, then the mind goes initially into a state which is called access concentration or neighborhood concentration in which five mental factors start to become very prominent or strong. In Pali, these are called Vitaka Vichara, Piti Sukha Ekagata. Vitaka is, here it's translated, I don't like this translation now, applied thought and Vichara sustained thought But Vitaka, applied thought, and Vichara are not necessarily thinking the way we ordinarily think in the sense of conceptual thinking, uh, discursive thinking, thoughts revolving one after another after another. But Vitaka, applied thought, is that mental factor which applies the mind to the object, the mental factor which is responsible for, in a sense, metaphorically, lifting the mind up and placing it on the object. And then vichara, translated here, sustained thought. Now I translate it exploration. I'm sorry, examination. It's the quality of mind which examines the object. The two always function very, very close together. So it's really difficult to distinguish them. But we could think of vitaka, applied thought, as the factor which throws the mind, not necessarily forcefully, or lifts the mind and places the mind on the object. And vichara as the factor which anchors the mind on the object or the factor which examines the object. Not reflectively, not thinking, oh, it has this aspect, that aspect, but it's just a kind of looking at the object. And as one is approaching the jhana, then a quality called piti which means joy or rapture, becomes prominent. And along with rapture, there also occurs a kind of pleasure or happiness in the mind. And the fifth factor is called one-pointedness of mind. Chittase kagata. And to attain the first jhana, according to this formula here, the text reads, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, I entered and dwelt in the first jhana. Okay, so quite secluded from sensual pleasures. This means to attain the jhana, the mind has to be, or the person has to be, drawn away from, withdrawn from actual engagement with sensually enjoyable objects. And then by the expression secluded from unwholesome states, the mind has to be disengaged from the five hindrances that I mentioned sensual desire, ill will, dullness and drowsiness, which are grouped together as one, restlessness and remorse, that's the fourth, and doubt or perplexity, the fifth. And so now, withdrawn from these unwholesome states, The Bodhisattva enters and dwells in the first jhana in which there are present applied thought, sustained thought or examination, rapture, and then this pleasure or happiness 
born from the seclusion of the mind, from sensually enticing objects and from the inner hindrances. Now going deeper in the process of concentration, applied thought and sustained thought, which are still gross factors, subside and fade, fall away. And with this, the mind enters into the second jhana, in which there is no more applied and sustained thought. But now it acquires a certain clarity, an inner clarity. Here it's rendered self-confidence. I think that's not so adequate. Ajitang, was it Ajitang? Sampasadhanang. That's it's hard to render exactly in English, but it's a kind of inner clarity. Clarity as well as tranquility together. And singleness of mind. Chaitaso e kodi bhavam. It's the unification of the mind is becoming stronger because the concentration, the force of concentration is increasing. And so there's no applied and sustained thought, but there's still joy or rapture and pleasure or happiness. But as the concentration deepens, then rapture or joy becomes experienced as a coarse factor, a disturbing factor, and that fades away. And with the fading away of joy, mindfulness and full awareness or clear comprehension become stronger. This is sati and sampajanya now become more prominent. And equanimity becomes stronger. And so one is still experiencing sukha, pleasure or happiness, but there's no more disturbance by piti, by joy, by or rapture. And so when the Bodhisattva then enters and dwells in the third jhana, which is described that one has a pleasant abiding who is equanimous and mindful. And then going, taking the process of concentration still further than even the pleasure or happiness of the third jhana fades away. And so here it's described with the abandoning of pleasure and pain and with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, I entered upon and dwelt in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure, because it has a neutral feeling, feeling of balance, without pleasure or pain, but it's a very pleasant sense, though it's not pleasant feeling. And it has purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. The equanimity has become so firmly established that the mindfulness is now fully purified. Okay, I think maybe I should just, we should pause at this point and then take up next time. If there's any questions on anything discussed, please feel welcome to ask. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there must be significance since, it, since it's included in that description of the third jhana. Um, historically, I mean, I don't know <laughs> what the antecedent of it might be, but one could say that within the scheme of the advan- of the schema- schematization of the meditative states, 
we see equanimity coming to play a more and more prominent role. Equanimity has to be present in any of the jhanas, but in the first two jhanas, it's still, though present, it's somewhat in the background because first there's vitaka and vichara, think thought and examination, or applied thought and sustained thought, which are causing, say, waves and ripples on the mind. And then there is that joy or rapture, which is an exhilarating state, an uplifting state. And so that is something of a disturbance which prevents equanimity from showing forth. But in the third jhana, with the fading away of rapture, then mindfulness, sati, and full awareness, sampajanya, come into the foreground. Though they're present from the start, but now they become so prominent that they're mentioned in the formula. And along with that mindfulness and full awareness, there comes equanimity. So it's now mentioned as a factor of the third jhana. And then in the fourth jhana, even though equanimity is present in the third jhana, but it's still in something of a state of competition with the pleasant feeling, sukha. Pleasant feeling because the mind naturally craves for pleasure. And so when there's a pleasant feeling in the third jhana, there's a tendency to become attracted to it and attached to it. And that is a challenge to equanimity. But in the fourth jhana, even that very subtle and very refined, blissful pleasure of the third jhana fades away and neutral feeling, feeling which is neither painful nor pleasant, becomes established. And when that is established, then equanimity flourishes and reaches its very high point of development. I think we might compare this as a simile I thought of just now. Yeah, wait, 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 wait. I'm just trying to think of a simile. It's a little bit maybe like trying to look at constellations. First, one is in a city. Even on a clear night, one looks up at the sky and one just sees a few of the more prominent constellations. This is like maybe equanimity in the first jhana. (laughs) You know, there are other constellations there, but you can't see very clearly because the city lights and the pollution from the city that um, obscures the constellations. But as one moves out into the country, maybe one comes to the suburbs, less lights, fewer lights, and so one could see more constellations. When one comes out into the deep countryside, then one can look up at the sky and one sees many, many hundreds of constellations. Does one know? (laughs) Not, yeah, uh, stars, let's see, stars. One sees many, many stars. So the further one is away from lights of the city and the pollution of the city, the more clearly one could see the stars in the sky. Okay. You mentioned the four Brahma Viharas. Yeah, that equanimity, it's a little different from this equanimity. That is the equanimity of in relation to beings, living beings, not having special attachment to some and aversion to others, no favoritism. Though it's connected with the quality of equanimity. But this is here, this is purely equanimity as a factor in the jhanas. Yeah, please. Uh, about the, the term base of imagination and base of the Yeah, neither perception nor non perception. Um, is this because of the base means that it, it's bringing back? Again, um, ayatana. Ayatana. That uh, is bringing the rebirth, reappearance. Does it have that kind of a meaning in there? That doesn't seem to be implied 
in the actual meaning of the word ayatana. Ayatana It doesn't seem to be part of like the word meaning of ayatana. Ayatana, I think it means just something which is stretched out, like a spread out area. And then somehow it came to be used as a technical doctrinal term in Buddhism. But my point is that, according to Buddhism, if one attains the ayatanas as meditative states and masters them and still has mastery over them at the time of death, then the karmic that meditative state generates a karmic power which will direct the consciousness to the realm of existence that corresponds to itself. So, we can say the meditative states are called ayatanas or bases in the sense that they are bases upon which the mind rests in meditation. And the realms are also called ayatanas in the sense of bases upon which the rebirth process takes place. Yeah. Then it uh, comes back. I mean, it's not the end. It's not, it's, it's not like a, the final. Well, we, when we say that what keeps the process of rebirth going would be the ignorance and craving, not so much the attainment of the meditative, of these meditative states themselves, but it's these meditative states which generate the karmic, certain karmic forces that will direct the rebirth process to these realms of existence at the time of death. Let me see if I can think of an example. No, an analogy doesn't come to mind, right? (laughs) Okay, let's, okay. An analogy, maybe having the radio plugged in to the electric, what do you call this, the electric outlet, and having it turned on is what keeps the radio on. That is like ignorance and craving causing the continuation continuation of samsara. But the particular station that you turn to determines what kind of sound comes out of the radio. If you turn to a musical station, then you get music. If you turn to a news station, you get news. If you turn to a talk show station, you get a talk show. So that is like the karma, the station that you turn to. But what keeps the radio on is the flow of electricity coming from the wall coupled with the turning of the knob or dial to the on position. Additional questions, comments? The word jhana, okay, that's a good question. It comes from the root what is the root actually? <laughs> jayati, or anyway, I know the verb form, jayati. Yeah, it comes from, in Sanskrit, the root jai. In Pali, I think the root would be jai, which means originally it meant to think very closely, very intently upon something. And so it took on the sense of to contemplate And then it meaning evolved to mean a state of absorbed meditation upon something. And sometimes in the Buddhist text, the word jhana is used simply in a state that, in a sense that we would translate 
simply as meditation in the sense of some kind of contemplative practice. But it came to acquire in early Buddhism the meaning of certain specific states in very precisely defined states in which the mind enters particular types of we call it absorption upon the object. These are states in which the ordinary processes of sensory awareness are left behind. There's no awareness of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. I've heard different opinions about whether there can be awareness of sounds in a jhana. Some say that there can be a very faint recognition of sounds, but it's no disturbance to the state. Some other persons say that in real jhana, there's no perception even of sound. And so these become a standard set of meditative attainments in early Buddhism, which again, they belong to the sphere of samadhi. In fact, in the Buddhist definition of right concentration, sama samadhi, in the Noble Eightfold Path, the sama samadhi, right concentration, is defined as the four jhanas. But the jhanas are not yet the attainment of insight or wisdom, but they do serve as a basis or foundation for the development of insight. And it's just interesting in terms of the historical development of a term many people now know of Zen Buddhism. And they think Zen is the Japanese word. But in fact, <laughs> the word Zen actually comes from, I think it was probably a Prakrit form of the word, like the Pali, jhana, which came to China and so the early Indian monks would have spoken about jhana. And then jhana became known as the Indian word for meditation used by the Chinese. And that became transmuted into from jhana to chan, just dropping out the final A, chan. And then when chan Buddhism came to Japan, the ch got changed into z, and it became Zan or Zen. <laughs> Any further questions? Okay, yeah, please. They have to speak more loudly. Yeah. I think that's putting an interpretation on it. But I don't want to comment on that right now. We'll just see where the texts lead us as we go on. Okay, then I think we should stop for now. I want to just give some proposal for the way I will continue with this. Um, Next week I will finish the Bayabhairava Sutta and then come to the Mahasachika Sutta. That's number 36. Number t- Majima number 12, Mahasihanada Sutta. I suggest for you to read paragraphs 44 to 61, just to get a fuller picture of the Bodhisattva's practices during his period of self-mortification or asceticism. I don't, I won't explain that. There's no need for me to explain the ascetic practices. I'm not going to discuss, I had listed here, Sangyutta Nikaya 1265 and Diga Nikaya 14 as handouts. But then I realized in order to, these give very close perspectives on the Buddha's enlightenment in terms of his realization, understanding of Paticca Samuppada, dependent origination. But then I realized that to explain this, 
then I have to give a detailed account of the Ticca Samuppada, and so then it's like taking a subject which quite an advanced technical subject and then bringing it to a very early point in our exploration of the suttas and I prefer to go really systematically step by step. That's good if you've already quite well read in the Buddha's text then it's interesting to look at these suttas in connection with the previous ones. But I might come back later to a kind of, after we've covered dependent origination and my systematic explanation, 